Welcome to today's event on the future of U.S. nuclear strategy, releasing the 2022 Nuclear Posture Review. My name is Matthew Kranig, and I'm the Director of Studies at the Atlantic Council and Acting Director of its Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. Uh, the Atlantic Council is delighted to partner with the United States Department of Defense to roll out the 2022 Nuclear Posture Review, released last week alongside the National Defense Strategy and Missile Defense Review. I'd like to thank our distinguished panelists for participating in this event and our audience for joining us in person here at the Council's offices and for tuning in virtually. I'm especially grateful to Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Richard Johnson and his office for selecting the Atlantic Council as a partner for publicizing this strategy. Here at the Atlantic Council, our Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security works to develop sustainable nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States and its allies and partners. We seek to honor General Brent Scowcroft's legacy of service and embody his ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security, support for U.S. leadership and cooperation with allies and partners, and dedication to the mentorship of the next generation of leaders. The Scowcroft Center's namesake, General Brent Scowcroft, was the chairman of the 1983 Scowcroft Commission that established the foundation for U.S. nuclear deterrence and arms control policy through the present day. As the United States enters a new era of strategic challenges, the Scowcroft Center is proud to play a role in crafting an effective and nonpartisan strategic forces policy for the 21st century. Consistent with that mission, the Center's forward defense practice area is designed to shape the debate around the greatest military and defense challenges facing the United States and its allies and creates forward-looking assessments of the trends, technologies, and concepts that will define the future of warfare. Since the presidency of Bill Clinton, each new presidential administration has released a Nuclear Posture Review, or NPR. This document serves as an invaluable public articulation of U.S. nuclear strategy, contains important statements of U.S. declaratory policy regarding nuclear weapons, explains what nuclear capabilities the United States needs, and how they contribute to deterrence, uh, and also sets forth priorities for arms control and nonproliferation. The 2022 Nuclear Posture Review comes at a time when U.S. nuclear deterrence is under more stress than in recent decades. Russian President Vladimir Putin is making explicit nuclear threats in his war of aggression in Ukraine. China is dramatically expanding its nuclear force this decade. Iran is on the verge of becoming a nuclear weapon state. And North Korea continues tests of nuclear-capable missiles. In this context, the United States is carrying out a thoroughgoing modernization of its aging nuclear triad. To discuss these issues, we're privileged today to welcome a range of distinguished current and former U.S. government officials and journalists. Uh, the first segment of our event today will feature a fireside chat with three serving officials with responsibility for U.S. nuclear policy. Uh, Richard Johnson serves as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Policy, an office which plays a critical role in writing the NPR. Prior to his current position, Dasty Johnson served in several nonproliferation positions in the State Department, National Security Council, and at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, a Washington, D.C. nonprofit. Alexandra Bell serves as Deputy Assistant Secretary in the State Department's Bureau of Arms Control, Verification, and Compliance. In addition to serving in a variety of arms control and nonproliferation roles at the State Department, Deputy Assistant Secretary Bell has worked in the think tank community, at the Council for a Livable World, Plowshares Fund, and Center for American Progress. Joining us from the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration is Ms. Cindy Learston, Director of NNSA's Office of Policy and Strategic Planning. Ms. Learston uh, has almost three decades of distinguished service in DOE, reducing WMD dangers globally, and helping mentor the next generation of leaders on WMD issues. Moderating this fireside chat is David Sanger, who is the White House and National Security Correspondent for the New York Times. Following the remarks, we'll move on to a panel of experts and former officials, including Walt Slocum, Rob Sufer, Leonore Tamero, myself, uh, moderated by Dimitri Sevastopoulos. Uh, Walt Slocum is a board director at the Atlantic Council. He's had a distinguished career, including service as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. Rob Sufer and Leonor, Leonor Tamero both served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy in the Trump and Biden administrations, respectively. Uh, both also served as senior congressional staff members on the Armed Services Committee uh, of the House and Senate, respectively. Uh, and I had the privilege of working closely with Rob Sufer when uh, he was in his role. Uh, Dimitri Sevastopoulos is the U.S.-China correspondent at the Financial Times. He'll be the moderator for the second panel. I'd like to remind everyone that this event is public and on the record. 
Uh, we encourage our audience on Zoom to ask questions using the Q&A tab, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. During the Q&A session, our in-person audience members can raise their hands with any questions, and a member of our staff will bring you an iPad to type in your question. Since this event is public, please be sure to identify your name and affiliation with your question. We also encourage our audience to join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag Forward Defense. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank you all for being uh, with us for this event, uh, and I'd like to congratulate uh, government officials for getting uh, this important document across the finish line. I know it's uh, 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 a difficult task, but uh, they were successful in producing a, a fine document. And so with that, uh, over to you, David, to begin our discussion. Well, thank you, Matt, and thank all of you for joining us. It's great to be back at the uh, Atlantic Council. Uh, it's particularly great to be at uh, the Scowcroft Center. When I first came to Washington in, oh, I guess nearly three decades ago, no one spent more time with me, educated me more than Brent Scowcroft. And so we uh, were all living with his uh, fine legacy here. And at the Aspen Strategy Group each summer, um, we all feared uh, Brent's uh, hike up the mountain because in his 80s, he was sprinting ahead of people who were half of his age and sort of leaving us um, embarrassed and literally in his dust. Um, so um, the Nuclear Posture Review is uh, a fascinating document, and uh, it's fascinating because if you go back and you compare it over uh, many years, you begin to discover uh, changes that are indicative of, of new administrations. Um, but this one, as Matt suggested, comes at a particularly fraught moment. And I think for many generations of students, uh, or at least two generations of students, you could get through an entire uh, high school and university courses without ever learning very much about nuclear strategy, the way uh, uh, some of us who are here are old enough to have done this during the Cold War uh, were imbued with it. Um, I think we're about at the at the moment right now where everyone's going to get their dose again, and so the strategy, the uh, posture review is is of particular interest. Um, Richard, let me start with you. Um, you've been through this process a few times, and uh, at DoD at DoD you had to go shepherd this one. If you had to sort of explain to somebody who was coming anew to nuclear policy, what's the difference between this posture review and the one that we saw in the Trump administration, or even what you saw in the Obama-Biden administration? What would, you, what would you say is different and notable here? Yeah, absolutely. And first of all, thanks so much to you, David, and to the, the Atlantic Council for hosting us today. It's a really important uh, part of what we call raising the nuclear IQ, as you were referring to. So I'm glad to be uh, doing that. Um, and as you point out, you know, there have been multiple nuclear posture reviews um, over the years, going all the way back uh, to 1994, uh, with the Clinton administration issuing that first one. Um, and if you look at those documents, you do see a lot of continuity, frankly, uh, in, in some of the things that we talk about. Deterrence has not changed that much over the years, but we are at a specific moment now where I think we do see increases in concerns, whether it's obviously Russian irresponsible threats, uh, not only their illegal invasion of Ukraine, uh, but doing, show, doing so under the nuclear shadow with very irresponsible nuclear rhetoric. Uh, the document also notes that, as you uh, said in the outset, uh, the growth of the Chinese nuclear force, uh, which is a new and important factor that we have to take into account that we haven't had to think about in previous nuclear posture reviews. The document makes very clear that we are now facing potentially uh, the rise of two nuclear armed competitors that we're going to have to take into account, whether it's from de a deterrence perspective or from an arms control perspective as well. Now, that having been said, I think one of the most important aspects of this 2022 NPR is that we see it as comprehensive and we see it as balanced. Uh, we think that there is just as much discussion in this document about the importance of nuclear deterrence, about our modernization of our nuclear forces and the triad, but also about things like arms control, risk reduction, strategic stability, all things that this administration has said that they want to regain the leadership role in, and that frankly are both parts of this broader effort that we have to undertake to reduce nuclear risks, avoid nuclear war, and reduce the global salience of nuclear weapons. So Alex, let me turn to you from what you've just heard from Richard. Um, he's got to worry about our defense posture for all this. You've got to worry about um, our set of, of 
treaties, restraints uh, on nuclear buildup at a moment that, quite frankly, we only have really one significant treaty left, New START. And as President Trump kept pointing out, and now the Biden administration itself has pointed out, if China is not a member of whatever follows New START, and it will expire in, what, 2026, right, um, then we've got a, a significant problem, because by DOD's own estimates, not in the nuclear posture review, but I think in last year's um, uh, China uh, defense review, there's an estimate that they could well have a thousand nuclear weapons by deployed by 2030. 2035. 2035. Um, of course, the United States uh, and Russia are limited to 1,550 each deployed, and have won that. And then, of course, we've got a, a tactical nuclear force of 2,000 or more uh, that the Russians have, and that's what we've been reading and hearing so much about. So as you look at this nuclear posture review, what are the diplomatic challenges that you see coming out of, uh, of this agenda for the remainder of the Biden administration? Uh, well, first, thank you uh, for having me here, and thank you to the Atlantic Council. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that this is something that people hadn't talked about for a while, and I'd always had the feeling that at the end of the Cold War, there was a kind of, oh, glad that's done, and everybody just shifted their focus, and uh, those of us who were continuing to labor on in the space. We're like, no, the threats are still here. <laughs> There's still a huge problem uh, to deal with, and, it, and it's becoming more complex, and there are more actors involved. Uh, so what I think is so important about this NPR uh, is there is an acknowledgment that deterrence and arms control and nonproliferation are mutually reinforcing and all a part of integrated deterrence and, and how we provide the maximum amount of tools available uh, in order to deal with the challenges that we're seeing in this space. Uh, you're correct, a new start is the last bilateral uh, major treaty between the United States and Russia. Uh, there are important multilateral treaties like the MPT, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, uh, which had its recent review conference uh, this past August, of course, the Chemical and Biological Weapons Convention. Uh, but in, in terms of the bilateral space, new start uh, is, is what we have left and we're working on uh, right now, making sure we get back to inspections that were paused because of COVID. Uh, and then thinking about what does happen next, because no matter what we do in 2026, that treaty will expire and we'll be facing a world in which there are you know, potentially no constraints uh, over the two largest nuclear arsenals in the world for the first time in over 50 years. Uh, it's not a safer world, uh, and we acknowledge that. And we acknowledge the, the difficulty uh, of getting to the next steps with Russia because we have different priorities. As you said, tactical nuclear weapons is an issue that we've long wanted to discuss with the Russians. We've made it clear that we don't think there is a discussion to be had where we just ignore huge parts of our arsenals, respectively, uh, and there are concerns that the Russians have long wanted to discuss with us. We've said we're happy to talk about those issues. Uh, they may not like our answers, uh, but there's work to be done in the space. Uh, there's the complication added by China and its expanding forces. Uh, we've been doing a lot to push out uh, sort of broadly to the global public uh, the concerns that we have about this expanding arsenal. We don't understand where China is going with this. It's in contravention, this buildup of their own stated posture and doctrine. Uh, and so as a first step, we'd really like to have a conversation with them about uh, each other's doctrines, about crisis communication, crisis management. Uh, we've been working this issue with the Russians for 60 years, and as everyone can see, it's still quite difficult. We're not in that space with Beijing yet, so there's work to be done to begin the conversation, we think bilaterally. Uh, there's also work in the P5 space uh, among the nuclear weapon states recognized under the MPT, and that work, even though it is quite difficult at the moment uh, due to the choices that Russia has made, we continue to try to keep expert level lines of communication open so we can have a multilateral discussion about the future of arms control. So lots of work to be done, uh, but this is a priority for the president. It has long been a priority for him. I think he uh, made this a campaign uh, issue for uh, his first Senate run back in, I think, 72. So right. this is something that he's focused on. And I think you see that reflected in the NPR. I was going to ask you just to tease out for the audience two things you made brief reference to. One was the absence of inspections under New START. You mentioned COVID, um, but uh, the Russians have claimed that because of sanctions on Russia, including air travel sanctions, they haven't been able to come in to inspect. They've banned us from inspecting. So we've gone probably the longest time I can recall under the treaty without seeing each other's 
Uh, one of your colleagues in the State Department said to me uh, recently that they thought this was on the verge of being solved. That was probably two or three weeks ago. Uh, what is the status of just resuming basic inspections with yeah, uh, so first I want to make clear that uh, the data exchanges that happen under New Start have continued mm -hmm. apace. I get the, the notifications every day, uh, and it, it has been helpful in these difficult times to get a real-time picture provided by those data exchanges of what the Russians are doing. Uh, and then every six months we do a, a mass data exchange, and so that has continued apace. Uh, but the, uh, you know, the, the sort of backup that you get from actually getting boots on the ground uh, in Russia is what we would like. Uh, to continue as soon as possible. There are logistical issues that uh, even though we put things into the treaty uh, uh, annexes about what happens if an inspector gets sick, we didn't necessarily anticipate what happens if there is a communicable disease where an entire inspection team can get sick at the same time in rapid succession. So those are the kinds of logistical issues that we need to work through with the Russians. Solvable problems, all of them. Uh, you think this is logistical? It is not. It is logistical. It is not there Ukraine is Ukraine-related. There is nothing preventing Russia from actualizing their uh, rights under the treaty right now, and, okay. and they know that. And and these problems uh, that we need to work out in terms of the the health and safety of our inspectors are important things. And there's also broader implementation issues that we discuss. You know, over the history of the treaty and the bilateral consultative commission, those have to continue. But uh, all the problems are logistical and solvable. And just to tease out something you referred to on China, just so it's clear for our audience, China's position so far has been, thank you, we're not interested in engaging in these arms control talks at all. Um, call when you have a different topic to discuss. Is that essentially <laughs> a, a, a reasonable uh, summation of their position at this point? Uh, it has been, and that's it's sort of uh, surprising given that China signed up to the MPT and the same commitments that the United States has under it, un, under it and is to pursue in good faith uh, conversations for the cessation of an arms race, to, to pursue this. There's no asterisk that says China doesn't have to participate until it feels like it. They have the same obligations. We're pressing them to engage us bilaterally, but we've also made clear we'll use the multilateral fora available to us to press these issues too, particularly the risk reduction issues. So uh, they, they will not escape the US on these issues and the need to actually have these conversations. So we're not operating based on miscalculations and misperceptions, the kinds of uh, situations that can lead to, you know, we're now at the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. We don't need to repeat that to know that we need to be at the table having conversations with each other. And I might just add, if I may, I mean, there's, if they don't want to have a discussion in a bilateral channel, there's other ways that China can demonstrate to us that they're not pursuing things that we think that they are. We're extremely concerned to see, for example, the construction of two fast breeder reactors in China that could create quite a bit of plutonium for the use in nuclear weapons, as well as the reprocessing facilities uh, that would go about in actually extracting that plutonium. Uh, there are ways to run fast breeder reactors uh, for civilian purposes that don't require the use of the kind of the fuel that they're using. There's also ways that they could, through whether it's the International Atomic Energy Agency or through other means, to demonstrate some transparency. There, in years past, all of the P5 would declare their plutonium stocks for civilian purposes for some transparency. The, the Chinese have stopped doing that, uh, and that's a real concern. So uh, you need plutonium, you need fissile material to make nuclear weapons. If they're going to be making this much fissile material, it would be good for them to demonstrate that they're not intending to uh, divert it to military purposes. And right now, that doesn't require any talks at all. It could be done through the IAEA or bilaterally, um, but we haven't seen that out of Beijing. I don't get what the diversion issue is. They're fairly clear to me that uh, we have 1,550 deployed, the Russians have 1,550 deployed, and they wouldn't want to get into any discussion until they had a similar number, of which the 1,000 that is in the Pentagon estimate would still put them a little below the U.S. and the Russian levels. So the way they put it to me is, well, if you guys want to cut down to 300, we can start talking right now. Okay. And I haven't heard a Democratic or Republican president express any interest in doing so. I think the point here is, is that, and you asked for questions about different approaches in the right. administrations, and this is not meant to be a critique, it's just to, to point out the previous administration did look at sort of trying to have kind of a trilateral yep. set of talks between Beijing, Moscow, and Washington. What we're talking about in this NPR and that Das Bell has mentioned is much more basic things, sort of the foundations of arms control, risk reduction, um, information exchanges, military deconfliction, 
um, uh, it channels for crisis communication, the foundations of which we had with, with Russians many, many decades ago. So we're not even asking to have a discussion about numbers right now. Mm -hmm. So if that's the argument that Beijing is giving, we're not asking to have a discussion about numbers. We're saying, let's talk about putting some guardrails into the relationship so that we don't have unnecessary crises and the risk of miscalculation when things happen in the region. That's really all we're saying. Um, Cindy, let me turn to you because the Energy Department's got a particularly fascinating um, uh, piece of this, a big piece of this, uh, because so much of the Nuclear Posture Review refers to the modernization of the American force. It discusses retiring a, a couple of classes of uh, older weapons, but it also describes a modernization process that if you're the U.S. government, you say this is all about safety and reliability. And if you are a U.S. adversary, you say, no, this is all about building more precision weapons, um, getting rid of dumb bombs, putting in smart bombs, and that that alone is destabilizing. While it doesn't change the numbers, it changes the defensive uh, posture for an adversary to the U.S. So will you talk us a little bit through the discussion in NPR about the distinctions between reliability and true modernization? Sure. Um, first of all, I just echo thank you to Atlantic Council and to you also. Um, we are very busy over at the National Nuclear Security Administration, um, Department of Energy, working on modernization. And in fact, when we um, joined our colleagues in uh, drafting the Nuclear Posture Review, uh, we really worked hard to stress how we need to modernize not just the weapons but the infrastructure and also give some time and attention to making sure that our lab plants and sites, that their workforce are ready to go because we can't do this without them. And so I just wanted to stress that you might hear a lot, uh, us mention a lot about modernization. Um, when we talk about the precision weapons, um, first of all, the warhead modernization activities um, they ensure that the nuclear weapons stockpile, we want to continue to meet Department of Defense requirements. And there are different components to modernization that I just wanted to hit on because I think it's important when we talk about the B-6112 and the, and the uh, W-93. There's four specific types of modernization activities. One is the life extension program, and that's what's happening with the B-6112. That is a... Um, the B-6112, it entered service in 1968, so that's over 50 years ago. And when we look at how we want to make sure that it's safe and secure, because that is our number one priority, to make sure that our nuclear stockpile is safe, secure, and effective. Um, the B-61, we so it's in a life extension program, and we are refurbishing, we're reusing, or we're replacing all of the bomb's nuclear and non-nuclear non components. And this will help with its reliability, and that's a significant point to mention. With these upgrades and the addition of the U.S. Air Force Supplied Tail Kit Assembly, the B-6112 Life Extension Program will balance greater accuracy, especially provided by that tail kit. And that's critical to sustaining the nation's air-delivered nuclear deterrent capability. Um, when you look at the W-93, that's a new program, and we are in the beginning phases. Um, but again, these are important modernization efforts. The W-93 falls under warhead acquisition. We also have alterations that we make under modernization and modifications. Um, so I would just stress that our approach is really to support the requirements that Department of Defense give us and to ensure that we've got a modernized infrastructure and that we have everything we can do to modernize um, the stockpile. So, Cindy, the critics of this approach say, yes, you're extending the lifetime. We, we get that. Right. But that, um, and in some cases, you're lowering the yield of some of these weapons. Mm -hmm. um, but that by making them more precise and making them of lower yield, um, you are almost creating a greater incentive to employ them in a non-nuclear, uh, what, what previously might be a non-nuclear uh, uh, conflict, uh, because it, it seems like it is more on par with a high-end conventional um, weapon. So in other words, that it's a little destabilizing under the cover of the name of modernization. Um, how do you answer that? Well, 
Richard, maybe we should talk about declaratory policy because mm -hmm. we have a no first use policy and yeah, we do not have a no first use sorry, policy. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it, sorry. It, it's something, but it's not no first use. No, did you that's call right. it? Yes. Did you call so, it? So our, our, our policy is that uh, we would only use nuclear weapons in extreme circumstances uh, threatening the vital interests of the United States, our allies and partners. And I think that gets to a really good point that, that Cindy is bringing up here is we, we have a very different approach um, when it comes to modernization than some of our adversaries. For example, look at the Russian systems. Russians are looking at uh, new, novel, frankly, rather you know, destabilizing systems, <coughs> including, to your point, uh, David, about low yield systems. Mm -hmm. What we're basically doing here- mostly about their tactical weapons. Exactly, tactical, so-called non-strategic nuclear weapons. What we're really doing here in our modernization program is looking to it, it basically replace legacy systems. The, the, the basic mix of systems that we're looking at in our modernization is not really changing over time. What we are doing is understanding that these systems, some of which, as Cindy pointed out, have been in, in their life for many decades, are coming to the end of their service life. And so we have to be able to prepare for this. And I think uh, Cindy's boss, uh, Administrator uh, Jill Ruby, has herself pointed out on multiple occasions that um, we uh, are kind of the end of life ext extension period is, has, has arrived for us. We are now looking at having to do some new systems because frankly technology just ages out. So to the critiques that we're somehow lowering the use, the, the declaratory policy is very clear and the document says this explicitly, that we have a very high bar for nuclear employment. Uh, we think that the declaratory policy that we've selected is stable and sensible and uh, frankly stabilizing, um, but it is true um, that you know there are for a, a narrow range of high consequence uh, strategic attacks that would have uh, those sorts of strategic effects using non-nuclear means that you know potentially there could be nuclear employment. So that's a really fascinating difference because that's the difference between no first use mm -hmm. and no first use in unless we would have a high strategically damaging um, uh, element to this. Um, President Biden, when he was candidate Biden, famously wrote a foreign affairs article. It was part of the campaign. And he said he wanted to move toward a definition that the sole purpose of uh, these weapons was deterrence. And there was an early move in the administration, which we reported on at the time, to insert that wording. Because you know, once you've made a, once you've made a campaign promise, it, it's pretty obvious if it doesn't happen when you've um, uh, when you've taken office, uh, and we heard from some extremely unhappy allies who were afraid that moving to sole purpose would get around exactly the conditions you just described, Richard. So tell us a little bit about how you folks move from the president's or then candidates' expressed desire to wording that was pretty much like what we saw in the last NPR under the Trump administration. Sure, and I'm, Alex would be a, may want to jump in here as well since we're talking about allies and partners. As a former State Department employee, I can never <laughs> <laughs> succeed in, in being a better diplomat than the State Department. But you're absolutely right that the President specifically asked us to look at a range of options for declaratory policy, including that option that had been laid out in that Foreign Affairs article. I think it's important to read what's in that entire sentence or sentences in that article, because in addition to saying the president or then candidate had a goal of seeking a sole purpose declaration, he also said he would only move in that direction upon the consultations of our allies and partners and with the United States military. Right. And that's exactly what we did. And we spent many, many months talking uh, to lots of allies in, in a process that I somewhat inappropriately called nuclear speed dating, mm -hmm. uh, where we talked to uh, many, many allies, both in our Euro-Atlantic region and NATO and in the Indo-Pacific to get their perspective on this. And what the NPR ultimately did is we looked at the range of threats and the range of possible attacks that had strategic impact on the United States, our allies and partners, and we went to see what sorts of attacks uh, nuclear weapons were necessary to deter and, and how that affected our allies and partners as well. And frankly, what we did is we came up with a series of options. And those options, um, of course, every department kind of weighed in on what their preferred option was, but ultimately we always knew this would be a decision by the president for exactly the reasons that you pointed out, because he had made a statement about this. And so I know there were lots of articles in, 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 in times past to saying that the Pentagon had already made a decision or the White House had already made a decision. No, none of that was the case. We forwarded our options to the president 
And the president decided, and this is the decision that he made with this particular approach. Um, now, that having been said, the document also makes very clear that we still have uh, as a goal to move towards a sole purpose declaration, but that we'll have to identify concrete steps to do that and work with our allies and partners to get there. But because of some of these sort of a narrow range of these high consequence attacks that could have strategic effects using non-nuclear means, especially some that we see particularly affecting our allies and partners, uh, we felt we couldn't move in that direction at this time. Um, those high consequence attacks, and I, I want to come back to you, Alex, in just a second on the on the allies here, uh, were described in the uh, by uh, General Mattis, then Defense Secretary Mattis, in his um, defense strategy in, I guess, 2018. Um, those seem to suggest that you might use a nuclear weapon in response to, say, a devastating cyber attack that took out infrastructure throughout the U.S. or some other conventional uh, attack. So just to be clear, that remains the policy of the United States government. So uh, the Nuclear Posture Review does not make a definition or provide examples of what we mean by a narrow range of high-consequence strategic attacks. What we do say is that we think that they are a very narrow range, and we think that the bar for nuclear employment in such cases is very high. It is true that in the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review, um, there were some examples provided of so-called uh, non-nuclear strategic attacks. Um, and my understanding from folks, uh, some of whom who still uh, work at the department, um, was that in some ways that was intended to sort of provide a narrowing and to, a better explanation of what this means. But to be honest, uh, perception is reality, and some people perceive that as lowering the bar for nuclear use. So we decided in this nuclear posture review not to provide examples, but simply to say, uh, we think that there are a narrow range of these high-consequence attacks and leave it at that. But the examples haven't really changed. You don't you didn't look at those examples and say, nah, we wouldn't do that. We made a conscious decision not to, improve, not to include examples. I'll just put it that way. Hmm. Um, Alex, uh, when this debate was underway, I heard from some extremely unhappy allies who thought that you were on the way to using, to using the wording that the president suggested in hmm. his foreign affairs article. Um, tell us, what were their objections? Why, why would, because some of them, like Japan, obviously have a, you know, high sensitivity on the use of nuclear weapons, understandably so, given the history. Uh, well, yes, I, I, we had a range of uh, positions from allies uh, that, you know, we pr sort of purposely didn't share individually. Uh, X country said this, uh, but it was clear from the beginning that uh, as was laid out in the interim national security strategic guidance, uh, that we were going to use diplomacy as a tool of first resort, uh, that we were going to have this very iterative and collaborative process with allies to go through this. And in a certain respect, yes, there is a, a difference between what candidate Biden said uh, and where the NPR is. But I sort of think that's how policy works in, in the sense of we went through the process, we reviewed all of the options, not really on the timeline that may have been reported in the press. We would often find ourselves in the room surprised to hear that we had been discussing things that we hadn't even got to. A lot of those articles about declaratory policy came while we were still discussing the threat environment mm -hmm. and hadn't even started discussing policy options yet. So I, I think there, you know, a, a little bit of churn. Can't you know. believe what you read in the press. <laughs> you know that well, I, 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 who are those guys? I, I think this was a focal point because the president had had been very clear yeah. on it. But and by engaging in this very iterative and collaborative nuclear speed dating process, uh, where we had meetings after meetings, um, created an environment where there was a lot of churn and people trying to wonder what it was. Uh, that we were doing, but we actually thought that was more important to have that process and understand that that would, you know, create articles that maybe, you know, were leading in one direction or the other where we hadn't really gotten there yet. Uh, you know, we, we would rather deal with that problem than deal with allies feeling they hadn't been properly consulted and probably properly heard as far as what they saw, thought were the nuclear threats facing us uh, in the 21st century. So I, I think, you know, allies are sort of resoundingly happy about the engagement process. We heard that over and over again. Thanks for, you know, even if there were certain points in the NPR that some countries liked a little bit more than others, you know, the, the overall effect was that people really appreciated the engagement. And I think we came up with a policy that's reflective of where the president would like to go, but is, you know, also taking into account the security environment we're currently in and the, you know, the, the you know, signal that we heard for the continuation of strategic ambiguity you know, in our declaratory policy. 
And when the president was presented with those options, he, he went with, you know, what we had, which, you know, I, th I think is, is fitting for the environment, and, but also aspirational in, in right. terms of where he would like to go. So, Cindy, we, we've made some references uh, here to tactical nuclear weapons. We've mm -hmm. said they're not covered by treaty. Mm -hmm. uh, we've said the Russians have 2,000 of them. It seems to be what Putin every once in a while is referring to, although in recent days he made the claim that they are not thinking of using nuclear weapons, which we hope is, uh, hope is true. Mm -hmm. um, but in your discussion before, you discussed upgrading... Um, uh, the B-6112 uh, and, and others. Has there ever been discussion that you're aware of within the Energy Department, within NSA, about a significant change in the way we use tactical weapons or the way we develop them? We only have a couple of hundred left. We had vast numbers during the Cold War. Um, they're expensive to protect. Um, I can't find anybody who can describe to me a decent strategic use for them other than the fact that they keep some allies happy because we store them in Belgium and Italy and uh, Germany and, of course, famously in Turkey. Um, why, do we, why are we keeping these now, and why are you still working on them? Well, <laughs> Richard, maybe you can help out a bit. I just want to, um, so we have an entire, you know, the defense um, programs who really gets to the heart of what you're asking. Um, so I don't know if you'd want to I'm happy to chime in address. just to add, yeah. you know, NNSA ultimately, you know, in some ways um, is... They're doing uh, what they're being asked to do. Is they're doing what they're being asked <laughs> to do. Right, right. So, right. So, but but, but, but what, I, what I can say on, on, on this is, you know, you're right that we um, have a different mix, you know, I can't get into all the details, but we have a different mix in our stockpile in terms of these sort of so-called non-strategic nuclear weapons. We have relative, compared to the Cold War, we have tiny numbers sure. right now. Ex uh, yes, okay. and, and certainly things like the presidential nuclear initiatives brought that down. But, and you know, widely reported as maybe a couple of hundred, which can you say? I, I can't get into any numbers and things like that, but, but what I can say, and maybe this is a, not to change the topic too much, but we've had a lot of discussion on this because there were questions about um, decisions we made, and I should say one of the strengths of the NPR and the NDS on top of it is we did this in parallel with the budget process. Right. And so our budget matches up with what we need, and to the point that you were asking Cindy about, it also matches up with what NNSA's budget is. And, and we made some decisions about what we needed to do in terms of uh, what kinds of low-yield, uh, lower-yield weapons we needed to have. And there was a big debate about whether or not uh, we needed to have the so-called sea-launched cruise missile, mm -hmm. um, and that was a program that the previous administration put forward, along with uh, a ballistic missile uh, uh, of lower yield that was uh, also uh, deployed onto our submarines, the so-called W76-2. Um, and I think what we did is this NPR validated because, in large part, because of this threat that you're raising from Russia, and to a certain extent we have concerns about what the PRC is doing, that part of one of our goals as the United States is to deter limited nuclear use, not just the so-called strategic exchange. We always thought about this, you know, but limited mad. use in the, in, in the Ukraine kind of situation that we're describing right now. Uh, right. Any, any use of a nuclear weapon would have a strategic effect and would fundamentally change the nature of a conflict. And that we say that in the document, we think it's important that we deter such use. And so what we determined was we have an appropriate mix of things going forward. Uh, my boss, Secretary Austin, said it better than I could when we rolled out the NDS, which was to say, in a very short sentence, we have a lot of capabilities. And what those capabilities are include not only the B-61-12, which, by the way, is also going to be deployed using new fifth-generation aircraft, things like the F-35, but we also have this W76-2 from a submarine. Uh, we have air-launched cruise missiles, and those are going to be upgraded. A lot of investment in NNSA on the so-called long-range standoff warhead, which will be a new weapon uh, to replace those air-launched mm -hmm. cruise missiles that has a certain standoff capability. And so when you combine all of those sorts of things together, we feel like we have the capabilities we need to deter limited nuclear use, but not necessarily in the ways that the Russians have gone uh, so much more uh, in a destabilizing direction with these new and novel systems. But you announced you're killing off two of these, the submarine-launched 
So we're, we're not continuing this, this submarine's launch because we, we think it has marginal utility when you add to all those other capabilities. Those were already deployed on a small number of no, submarines? No, no, the sea launch cruise missile was still in a, in a developmental phase. So mm -hmm. it never has gone anywhere. The system that we're retaining is the one that is currently deployed on the submarines now, okay. onto the boomers. And, and we should also point out that that, uh, that sea launch cruise missile could very well have been placed onto attack submarines, which kind of changes the mission a little bit of our submarines. We have different kinds of submarines for different missions, and there was lots of discussion about whether that would you know, impact the effectiveness of those attack submarines. The other uh, system that we are uh, retiring um, is the B-83 gravity bomb, uh, which is not a low-yield weapon. In fact, it's quite, quite the opposite, uh, which we think over time has had sort of a diminishment of usefulness. Um, but that having been said, the report does point out that we do need to do more work to make sure we can get after uh, some of what we call the hard and deeply buried targets, or so-called HDBT, right. because it's the Department of Defense and we have to have an acronym. Um, but we recognize that we're going to have to get after those uh, potential challenges uh, with certain adversaries, and we're going to be doing a major study looking at what capabilities we could bring to bear to that challenge, whether those are nuclear or non-nuclear. And the, um, just one more on the tacticals for uh, uh, both uh, you and Alex. Um, the basing that I hear the most concern about um, is in Turkey, where uh, we keep these weapons at uh, Insulik Air Base, which is a, uh, uh, a Turkish uh, base. You may remember during the coup attempt, this was a, a big issue uh, uh, at the time. Uh, we were concerned about losing access to the base. Turned out in the end, we did not. Um, but uh, there was a significant movement and planning going on within the Obama administration at the time this was happening for what would happen if you had to go get those out. Can anybody give an explanation to us about why it is that we would want to keep weapons in Turkey given the instability that we've seen there episodically and the relationship between the Turks and the Russians that has got everybody a little bit, bit nervous? Yeah, I mean, maybe it started and turned over oh, to you. Yeah, I, I would just say uh, State Department supports the extended deterrence mission. That's certainly something we got from the consultation process uh, that was important to our allies. Uh, you know, at the same time, the United States, no matter where uh, uh, weapons are deployed in the world, we're going to make sure they're safe, secure, and effective. Uh, and so that's something that's a priority for, you know, all three of uh, our departments and the, and the broader interagency, um, you know, so and, and we'll continue to do so in consultation with NATO. Yeah, I, I don't think I could say better than that, just to say, you know, we have a lot of regular consultation within NATO on all of these issues. And that issue of safety, security, the, the surety of the weapons is something that we talk a lot about. And so, you know, I can't get into a lot of the details about things like stationing and basing, but I will say that, you know, for now, we feel like we have what we need in terms of uh, that sort of uh, extended deterrent within NATO. We will continue to have those discussions. As you know, there are things like the so-called uh, NATO nuclear planning group um, mm -hmm. and associated groups that we meet very regularly on this issue um, and talk about these issues. And I can say that I think NATO has made great strides, even in the last few years, on some of these issues. Um, not only on broader deterrence issues from kind of that higher level, but on things like safety and security. And so we're going to continue to do that, um, and, and that's, uh, that's kind of part of our mission. I, I feel like I've heard a perfectly good diplomatic and, and bureaucratic answer here, but I know you have colleagues who believe that it is crazy to keep those weapons in Turkey under these conditions or the conditions we saw in the past couple of years, because while you can talk about safety and security, if they are on a base that is controlled by a foreign power and the foreign power says, we don't want you here anymore, you've got a problem mm -hmm. that can come up almost overnight. And that was exactly the fear during, the, during that time. So just one more time, can anybody sort of defend this? What I would say is this is a constant issue that we're dealing with. We're always looking at what does it look like? What does the overall picture look like of our NATO nuclear deterrent? And we work very closely with all of the allies that participate in that deterrent, not necessarily those always who necessarily have weapons in their locations, but you know, across the entire alliance. And so um, I don't, uh, you know, what I would say is we are very cognizant about security. It is an incredibly important thing because um, frankly, um, it is important not only to us, but it is important to those allies and those partners that also rely on our deterrence. And they don't, they have to answer to their 
domestic politics to their neighbors, uh, and they have to make sure that they can say that things are safe and secure in their region. So while I'm not going to get into the details about any specific country, what I will say is this is a live topic. We're always looking at it to make sure that we have the level of security that we need, and we'll continue to do that. Okay. Cindy, you also have a, a mission within the, uh, within the Energy Department and NSA about nonproliferation mm -hmm. and being able to try to detect uh, whether or not there is uh, movement of weapons, whether we've moved on to actual weapons. I remember during the Iran negotiations in 2015, some of your um, NSA colleagues were along on the, on, the, um, uh, on the ride of those negotiations, doing the calculations overnight. You know, if you agreed to this or that, what are the chances that we would see an Iranian move to actually build a weapon? Would we have the transparency? Tell us a little bit about, about that and where all that stands, particularly in uh, relation to Iran. Okay. Well, um, yes, we have um, supported and been alongside um, our agency counterparts, um, especially as we've gone into the Iran negotiations um, in the past. And um, we have a very robust arms control and nonproliferation organization and also counterterrorism. Um, you know, all areas that are mentioned in uh, the NPR. And, you know, if you look at nonproliferation, um, that's an organization where I um, started my career at the Department of Energy. We, uh, when we first started, we were starting to work with Russia, Ukraine, and um, Kazakhstan and Belarus at that time, a long time ago. And it's now really just expanded to working with many, many countries and looking to make sure that we can control and secure material as it's moved around um, the world or as some uh, countries try, try to acquire it. We also have you know, robust export control programs where we're working with international countries to make sure that you know, the technologies associated with the weapons, maybe not just a weapon itself, but the dual use technologies um, are, are tightly controlled and that we make sure that you know, we've got the conditions um, in place so that any transfers don't happen that should not be hands, um, happening. Um, but, you know, in the arms control area also, that's an important part of the NPR where we talked about renewing um, our abilities in arms control. And so at NNSA, we are working um, very seriously in investing, I think our FY23 request was $30 million to do more monitoring and verification to think of novel approaches to arms control, um, especially in the monitoring and verification area. Um, creating test beds at some of our lab plants and sites. And so if you look at the whole picture of what we're doing, I think it gets to what Richard said in the beginning. You know, there is a very critical piece with um, the weapons, but the nonproliferation, the counterterrorism, and the arms control, this all really creates that comprehensive and balanced approach that we're seeking um, to achieve as we implement um, the nuclear posture review. Cindy, let me drill down just one more time on, sure. on Iran. Mm -hmm. um, so we've seen Iran, since the last nuclear posture review uh, mm -hmm. came out, move to 60% enrichment. 60% um, enrichment is sort of like being on the 10-yard line. Uh, you know, you don't have to move the ball very far to get up to 90%, which is bomb grade um, uranium, and in fact, with 60%, you can some argue you could actually build a weapon. Um, the State Department has said, and I think uh, Secretary Blinken has said, um, we are now within probably weeks of breakout, right? In other words, if the Iranians decided they wanted to go from 60% to 90% um, and produce weapons grade, it would only take them a few weeks. Based on everything that you know about the work you've been doing on um, uh, nonproliferation, would we be able to detect a move from 60% to 90% mm -hmm. in time to be able to do much about it? Well, I would say, and I'd like to see if um, Alex and Richard want to weigh in, you know, the Atomic International Atomic Energy Agency, they are just, you know, our greatest partners. And, um, you know, they have a very uh, proactive relationship, um, you know, with, with many countries and um, with us. And so we really rely on the International Atomic Energy Agency to, um, you know, as it is allowed, provide us insight. Um, I don't know if you wanted to answer. Oh, uh, yeah. I, well, one, want to double down on the praise for the IAEA. Yeah. Uh, between what's happening, uh, their day-to-day -day duties, what's happening in Iran and what's happening in Ukraine, they, yes. they are yeah. just Very performing at, at a level um, that, you know, I'm so grateful for. 
uh, and particularly under Raphael Grossi's leadership. We're very lucky to have him there. Uh, but uh, He was just here last week. Yes, he was. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, do, making the, making the, the rounds. rounds. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I will defer uh, to Richard, who knows a little bit more about uh, JCPOA than I do uh, as I'm I'm over here in arms control land. That's more of a non-pro issue. I would just add, and I should say, I you know, obviously from the Department of Defense work on this a little bit less than I used to in previous jobs, yeah. but I think I can say with some confidence that, as Cindy alluded to, we really do rely on the International Atomic Energy Agency, Energy Agency with the access that they have. And even in the situation we have now, where the Iranians have somewhat limited access uh, under the so-called additional protocol, but we do think that that comprehensive safeguards agreement is still in place, and I think we do think that we could detect, uh, you know, a move to 90 percent. Uh, and then the question is, just a reminder is, you know, the now that is a key component, as you said, to mm -hmm. get to a weapon is having that bomb grade enrichment. But there are other components of the bomb that also would have to be created, uh, you know, the, the non-nuclear components of this in weaponization. And I should point out that the nuclear posture review itself says that, you know, Iran has not made a decision uh, to move towards a nuclear weapon. We're very concerned about the activities that they're undertaking that are relevant uh, to, to that, and particularly related to enrichment. Um, but we do think we have to remind ourselves that there are multiple elements to this piece and that we continue to press for Iran to you know, return to the JCPOA, uh, to have the kind of level of monitoring and verification that they have. But obviously, uh, you know, the steps that they've taken are very concerning. That, that line, Iran has not made a decision, jumped out at me when I was reading um, the document. I went back to our uh, sources in the intelligence community. I said, you know, this obviously had to be an approved line. You don't just throw that out there on DOD's, um, with, with all due respect to DOD. And they came back and said, yes, we have no evidence that they have made a decision. But that is different from saying that we have no evidence that they are making all of the necessary steps underway so that if someone makes that decision, they sure. could assemble that weapon in you know, a very rapid uh, viewpoint. Is that your view, that they haven't made a decision, but they are going ahead with the preparations for producing a weapon if the decision is made? I think our concern is, again, on the fissile material side. I, I'm not aware of, you know, either in, in this setting or others, about particular efforts on other elements of a weapon. Um, mm -hmm. But um, what I am aware of is, obviously, the advances that they've made um, in fissile material production. And you're absolutely right that our concern would be that, you know, there would be a quick turn, potentially, if a decision were made. We don't think that they've made that decision. We don't think it's something that they are thinking about. Um, but And we point that out in the document, but we also say that that's why we continue to be focused on finding a way to return to some level of oversight and uh, limitations on Iran's nuclear program. But if they did make that turn, it would still be a year or two before you got to an actual weapon? Uh, I, I don't remember what our exact public uh, definition is right now of that, but uh, it would be a, a, a significant amount of time. Okay. Um, a last question for you, and I think probably, Richard, this is more in your territory. Early in the Obama administration, there was discussion of, did we need the third leg of the triad, mm -hmm. right? Triad being having the ground-based force, the force from the bombers, and then, of course, the submarine force. Um, that discussion came up again in the Obama second nuclear posture review. In this nuclear posture review, there was just sort of an assumption that we were going to retain all three elements of it. Was there any serious debate about eliminating one leg of the triad? No, not really. I mean, there was a discussion, obviously, about the triad and, and whether it continued to be important. And this NPR validates that we think, you know, for a substantial time to come, we need to continue to have those three legs of the triad, the, you know, the ground-based leg with the ICBMs, the sea-based leg with submarines, and certainly the air leg with uh, with uh, bomb bombers and uh, and the like, and so the uh, as well as the fighter aircraft, um, and so no, um, there wasn't a big debate and discussion about this. I think there were good discussions about um, if you're going to continue to have a ground leg, like, what should that look like? And um, this budget and this NPR uh, moves forward fully on the development of the new ICBM, now called Sentinel previously GBSD. I think there was discussion about, did you need to do that? Could you uh, perhaps life extend the Miniman 3 one more time? We did look at that, and we determined that um, basically enough time had gone by that because of things like uh, changes in technology, the supply chain, uh, and the like, that it would actually cost us more money and give us 
more risk if we had tried to do one more extension. Um, so we looked at that, but at the end of the day, the NPR validated that um, there are, there's value to the triad, each of which uh, each element of which comes with its own particular value to it. Obviously, um, the ground-based leg is extremely responsive. Uh, the sea leg you know, is very survivable. And the air leg is visible and recallable. And so we thought that at least in this current moment, in the current security environment, and again, validated all the way up to the president, that we needed to retain the triad for this time. And uh, that's what we're doing. The argument for the other part of the ground base, though, is that it's a sitting duck. People know, you know, the Russians and the Chinese and everybody know exactly where it is. Uh, and therefore might not be very survivable. No, and so that's why I say, that's why the, in, the importance of retaining the triad, to make sure that we have a triad that has a good mix uh, and that looks at all those different sorts of characteristics. Um, again, the uh, ground leg is particularly responsive, um, and, and frankly, uh, our adversaries know that as well, and we think that it has value there, but we wouldn't responsive, want... responsive, you mean... It's the most responsive part of the triad. If we you, needed to, you could launch it fast. If we needed to move quickly, we could move quickly. Great. Well, I have many more questions for you, <laughs> but what we don't have is more time. Uh, so I want to thank you uh, all for your participation, uh, Cindy, Alex, Richard, for what's been a really great conversation. I've learned a lot along the way, uh, not only about uh, the arsenal, but about the way you're thinking about the arsenal, which I think is vitally important in this moment. And I look forward to the to the commentary that uh, that our group of, of <laughs> formers and other experts will do as, as we step off the stage and they'll be on in a few minutes to rip apart everything <laughs> that, uh, that we've all discussed. That's why we make the big box. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you.
program can be going out to our, our virtual audience. As soon as you see yourself, after a bit of music, that'll be your cue to start. If you have any comments to the virtual audience, welcoming back for the second panel, or any closing uh, remarks, or you know, thank you for joining us, please feel free to direct them into camera four that's just across the way. I can give you a quick wave, too, exactly. Yeah. All right, I'll leave it to you uh, to timekeep here. I think 15 minutes, as well. 15 minutes as well, happy to. And I'm just going to move this clock over because it looks as though this one is dead. Sorry, Eamon, can you uh, repeat that? Done. Exactly, and we've got Q&A on your iPad right there. Perfect. Yeah. All right, and just as with the first panel, our speakers often ask where they ought to be looking, and of course we ask that you just keep the conversation right up here on stage as though you're having a cup of coffee. Um, that would be ideal. Any questions? All right. Um, yeah, I'll give you the 15-minute warning as well as the 10. Everybody's got water? Excellent. All right, I'll pass it over to the control room to get us started. I'm just going to move this clock over here real quick, too, so you can take a look at the time. Welcome back to the Atlantic Council's uh, series of panels on the Nuclear Posture Review. My name is Dmitry Sevastopoulo. I'm the US-China correspondent of the Financial Times. Uh, in the last panel, you heard from three administration officials who were involved in writing the review. Uh, now we're going to talk to four uh, experts on nuclear policy, um, all of whom have been in previous administrations and know a lot about what's going on. No pressure. Uh, brief introductions again for anyone who's joining us uh, at this panel. We have uh, Leonor Tomero, who is a former Pentagon Deputy Assistant Secretary for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy. Uh, Robert Sufer, uh, who had the same position in the Trump administration. Uh, Walt Slocum is a former um, Under Secretary of Policy at the Pentagon. And Matthew Kronig, who is the Director of Studies here at the Brent Scowcroft Center for Strategy, Strategy and Security. Um, we will also have 15 minutes for questions uh, at the end, so please have a think about what you want to ask. Uh, you can ask them online, or for uh, the audience in the room, there'll be an iPad circulated into which you can add your question. Um, Matt, I'm going to start with, with you. Um, can you just explain, for, for the layperson, has the threshold for when the US would use a nuclear weapon changed with this nuclear posture review? Well, first, Dimitri, thanks uh, for doing this. And um, we, we, I'd like to say first, we, we are at the Scowcroft Center, and, and I do think that uh, there is a kind of a bipartisan uh, coalition in support of uh, U.S. nuclear strategy, and really an international um, consensus as well with our allies. And, and it was uh, formed to some degree with the Scowcroft Commission in 1983, which is strong deterrence and strong arms control. Mm -hmm. And I think you see that uh, continued in, in this uh, NPR um, and, um, you know, I think Republican administrations tend to lean a little bit more on the deterrence side and, and Democratic administrations lean a little bit more heavily on the arms control side. And I think you see that um, here, but I, I think there's a lot of continuity. Uh, so, so to your question, I think there's also a lot of continuity when you look at um, strategy. You know, the United States has never had a no first use policy. It's always left open the option of using uh, nuclear weapons mm -hmm. first. Uh, to deter uh, conventional attacks on, on us or our allies. Uh, and so uh, that uh, is here in this document uh, as well, deterring uh, strategic attack, whether nuclear or non-nuclear, uh, it says is the first role of nuclear weapons. Uh, the, there is some um, uh, you know, attention to the, the words uh, used in the declaratory policy. There was discussion of going to a, a sole purpose, you know, the only purpose of nuclear weapons to respond to a nuclear attack. Uh, but the, 
uh, this new document uh, doesn't go there. It, it does have this language about uh, fundamental purpose uh, while leaving open uh, the other roles. And, and we have uh, Rob here, here who oversaw the last um, nuclear posture review, but I believe there was even fundamental purpose language in, in the 2018 NPR. So again, I think uh, more continuity um, than, than change, and I don't really see a, a lowering or raising of the threshold of when the United States might use nuclear weapons here. Leonora, can I turn to you? I mean, the administration, as the former uh, panel of officials said, you know, they, they looked at no first use, they looked at sole purpose, they looked at a range of options. Ultimately, President Biden settled on this fundamental purpose declaratory policy. Major US allies were lobbying against any significant change in the nuclear posture, in the declaratory policy. They were very worried that Biden might shift to sole purpose. Do you think major allies, are they happy with the NPR as it's come out? Um, well, let me just first say, um, you know, I really want to commend um, Desi Richard Johnson and um, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Alex Bell um, and NNSA uh, uh, from the previous panel. This is the Nuclear Posture Review is a tremendous undertaking um, led by the Department of Defense, but it's really an interagency um, effort. Um, and, and so I think a lot of work went into um, getting to the document that they put out. Um, you know, I think as we heard in the previous panel, there was very significant consultation with allies. Um, that started when I was at the Department of Defense. Um, it started early on. Speed um, dating as one of the official. <laughs> but it. Yeah. Um, and so I think that consultation is very important. Um, there, you know, between the time when we started the NPR, right, and it's about um, eight months, right, it came, the classified uh, nuclear posture review came out in spring, uh, in the spring. And so it doesn't really give you much time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it actually, you know, to make big changes, you need to have sustained consultation with allies, um, you know, that that is broader than, you know, just the period of looking at what a review um, would do. And so I think if you're going to make big change, you have to have that allied buy-in. You have to make sure that allies are reassured. Uh, you have to explain why deterrence would be strengthened by any change, um, and that takes time. And can you, I mean, for the, the lay people in the audience who may not be steeped in this as, as, as much as the experts, can you explain why the allies might have been concerned about a shift to sole purpose? What is it about that that made them nervous? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think just generally, you know, change is always difficult. Um, you know, if, if a proposed change is happening without understanding the reasons for the change, uh, you know, I think that's difficult to understand. Um, you know, I, I think the administration got a range of views from different allies, uh, and mostly allies want to be reassured. We want to make sure that we've got strong extended deterrence um, for the allies, and uh, if we're going to change a policy that's been in place for decades, it has to come um, with either an alternative of how you're going to strengthen. This is not uh, that this is not zero sum, right? Mm -hmm. That we're not just uh, weakening deterrence, and to explain why a change in policy, including declaratory policy, um, would strengthen the credibility um, and strength of uh, U.S. assurances. Um, Rob, one of the big changes between now and 2018, when we had the last nuclear post review during the Trump administration, is that the Pentagon has said that China is expected, or the Pentagon forecasts that China will have as many as 1,000 nuclear warheads by the end of this decade, which is you know, roughly, I think, uh, four uh, or five times what they're estimated to have now. Um, the, the NPR and also the National Security Strategy, which came out recently, both say that by the 2030s, the US will have to deter two major nuclear powers. So I have two questions. One, does the US not need to do that already, given how much progress China has, has made? Um, and second of all, does the NPR kind of lay out a strategy for dealing with uh, how you deter two major nuclear powers kind of with any specifics? Right. Thank you for the question. And I think that is the, uh, the central question uh, of the next uh, four or five years. How do we address the two nuclear peer problem? Right. And so uh, you're, you're right in a sense that we've always had to try to deter Russia and China. But uh, I think the key phrase is major nuclear power. 
So China is not considered today a major nuclear power. People can, can disagree over that. Mm -hmm. But clearly, there's a difference between uh, a country with 100 nuclear warheads and 1,000 nuclear warheads, or whatever number it is. And so by the time uh, uh, Russia, I mean, sorry, China uh, deploys its 1,000 nuclear weapons, it won't just be the numbers, but the fact that they have a full triad. And the fact that in addition to the strategic systems, we're also going to have regional systems. So it's a whole new framework for, for addressing them. That, and that's why I think the administration rightly, and I got to tell you, they, they nailed the threat environment. They nailed the strategic environment in this review and the national security strategy. What they have said is basically uh, an indication that we are moving beyond the post-Cold War period. I mean, this, this is something, the, the idea of great power competition, it was actually signaled by the Obama administration, right, the, the, the rise of China. We reaffirmed it in the Trump administration, and they have now actually, you know, put it out there. It's the two nu nuclear peer problem, right? So that's a big deal. Uh, so they've done us a great service by teeing up the issue, but unfortunately, they don't answer the question. They don't, and, and, and uh, I understand that uh, they spend a lot of energy, I, I've done these reviews before, and uh, j just, just getting the fundamentals, reviewing the nuclear triad, addressing the no first use question, it takes up a lot of senior energy attention. And it's going to be hard for them to focus on that question. But they've teed it up, and now we need to move out. But I would say, if, if I could offer one, one um, uh, item of, of criticism uh, or, or just a, 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 you know, a question, is that, look, on the one hand, they've identified this problem, but there, there seem to be actions in the, in the review that... Um, preclude uh, options for dealing with the problem. So for instance, uh, they, they point out that uh, Russia and China are both increasing the, the salience and the reliance of nuclear weapons in their policy, and yet they continue to say that you know, eventually we want to move to, to uh, uh, reducing the role of, of nuclear weapons. But they also um, uh, eliminate sort of hedging as a central focus point, uh, which was in the Trump review. Of course, this administration, they're going to continue to hedge. They're going to continue to build a resilient uh, nuclear enterprise so that we can, we can, we can you know, hedge against the future. But by eliminating things like the nuclear sea launch cruise missile, I think they're taking away an option uh, to deal with the, this two nuclear peer problem. And I think it would have been um, advisable to leave it in there, may, maybe, maybe slow it down, further study it, but, but clearly uh, re eliminating that option um, is, is probably for me the, the, the greatest mm -hmm. uh, criticism of this document. Well, I want to come back to that in a little while and mm -hmm. also more broadly ask the rest of you whether you have views on the same question. But just specifically, Walt, uh, staying on China for a second, how do you see the implications for U.S. nuclear strategy or U.S. nuclear posture if China moves to having a thousand warheads? And then secondly, given how opaque the Chinese leadership is, how much do we know about what China is doing and why it's doing this now? <clears throat> I think in some ways the least of our problems with China is the possibility that they'll go from 200 to 1,000. Uh, there's a very flat return on numbers after a certain point, and I would say the numbers is about 200, maybe, maybe a little bit more. It's much more important that they're moving toward a, in effect, a triad that will increase survivability and once you get to those kind of numbers, yeah, makes some difference. And of course, the Chinese also have a lot of short-range stuff. Um, I think the more serious threats, and I think this is true of Russia too, is the use of the possibility of nuclear weapons for coercion. That is to deter the United States and our allies from doing whatever the Russians or the Chinese don't want done. Uh, this is the famous story about the Chinese general who said, we know that you wouldn't trade Los Angeles for Taipei. Uh, we're seeing it with Putin now. Uh, and, and I think dealing with that problem is perhaps the most serious one we have. We, as we've had a whole series of administrations that have basically said, yeah, we need a secure second strike capability. And oh, by the way, we need some other things too, because that's a power, it's got lots of problems. I think the place where we have not got a good answer, and yet it's the one thing we have to face literally today, 
is how do you deal with the potential of a threat of using nuclear weapons as a way of, for example, restricting aid, restricting aid to, to Ukraine, or in the case of China, of responding to a, to a Taiwan scenario. Now, I have views on what the answer might be, but I, I think that's definitely the question. Uh, Leonor Matt, do you want to weigh in on whether the NPR should have said more about how do you deter two major nuclear powers? Um, sure, I can start. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I don't think we should get into a numbers game. And that's my concern, right? There's a sentence in the Nuclear Posture Review that says, um, right, the uh, facing two major nuclear powers might require force structure changes. Um, you know, I think it's very dangerous um, to look at, you know, how many missiles, how many holes in the ground do we need? I think very quickly you get into a dangerous and expensive arms race, uh, and um, it's very important that we not do that. Um, it, you, it's not our advantage. Um, and again, you know, adding a certain number, you know, when you, we have 1,550 strategic nuclear weapons mm -hmm. deployed, right, if, if that doesn't deter, um, you know, will 2,000 do the trick, right? At, at mm -hmm. a certain number, the arithmetic is irrelevant. Um, so I think it's... Um, but just to, to slightly play devil's advocate, the Chinese clearly don't agree because if that was the case, they wouldn't be developing more. So mm. why do you think they're doing, doing what they're doing and it, how should the U.S. counter that? Well, they are, you know, they had um, about a tenth of what the mm. U.S. had, right? And so they're significantly increasing that. They're still going to be at a fraction of, of what the United States has. Um, and we should, uh, and I agree, we need to engage China. This is causing concern, uh, rightly so. Um, this is a significant increase um, in their nuclear arsenal, and we need to be talking to China about that. And they need to understand um, that that this is uh, might cause um, significant reaction. Um, uh, but I think more broadly, we need to also understand that they're making very significant increases in cyber and space capabilities, and those will increase. Um, the risk of miscalculation in a crisis that could lead to rapid escalation leading to nuclear use. And so we do need to be talking to China. Mm -hmm. It needs to be more than just about, we do need to talk about, of course, their nuclear modernization, but it needs to be broader. We need to talk about their expanding um, military capability, including capability in space. Mm -hmm. um, again, that could lead to miscalculation. We don't have um, we have no history of having talked to China. We've had a lot of near misses during the Cold War with Russia. We mm -hmm. have decades of history sitting down and talking to Russia, not only about numbers, right, but about doctrine, about their strategy, making sure that we understand what they mean, that they understand what we intend, um, uh, and, and we don't have that with, with China. We do need it. Has there been any kind of serious talks with China at all historically? If I could go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm afraid I am a skeptic about dialogue as the answer to all these problems. Um, we talk to China. This document talks to China. The Chinese talk to us by what they say. Yes, they're the, certainly the practical problems of so security, that sort of thing, and where there were. Um, Communi crisis communications, that's, that's mm -hmm. fine. The problem is, let's turn it around. What are we going to say? What are people like Johnson going to say when asked what American doctrine is? They're going to faithfully reproduce what it says in the nuclear policy review. That's why they wrote it. Uh, I think the problem is that our... We and China face a very different situation. Uh, the, the reason that the 200 is, is important is that with the 200 goes a very high degree of Chinese assurance of a second strike capability. Um, that I think our biggest task with China is to deter an attack on Taiwan, obviously. 
mostly that's not about nuclear weapons. That's about cyber, it's about space, uh, it's about navies, mm -hmm. it's about what the Taiwanese need to do to protect, uh, present their own effective defense. It's about dealing with more complicated problems like a blockade, not a Normandy invasion. Um, and in some ways, the dialogue takes place. Yes, you know, if we had a Henry Kissinger who could go out to talk to the Chinese, although I'd actually rather he went to Moscow right now, uh, that would be important and useful. But dialogue, in the sense of sitting in the same room, seems to me much less important than communicating effectively, mm -hmm. mostly through, through uh, public statement. E even though the U.S. puts out a nuclear posture review you know, roughly every five years, but China hasn't put out a big public document that I'm aware of that lays out why it's going from they, 200 to potentially 1,000 or more. They, they've said an awful lot. I mean, we don't like it. We often mm. don't believe it. Uh, yeah, what, that's one of the other problems. You hear <laughs> it is often the case that countries like people say what they th would like someone to believe about what they think. I'm not saying the Chinese are lying any more than we're lying. But I think that, the, as I said, I think the central problem is the use for coercion. And one of the ways we deal with that has nothing to do with nuclear weapons. It has to do with conventional capabilities, uh, the role, the, what the Taiwanese are prepared to do, building up alliances in Asia to, to join with us in confronting the, the Chinese. Mm -hmm. A dialogue is fine, but it's not really going to move the ball very far. So, Matt, what do you think the NPR should have said in terms of deterring two major nuclear powers and simultaneously, potentially? Well, I did want to come back to that because I do think this is a fundamental uh, issue. Ad Admiral Richard, uh, commander of U.S. Strategic Command, says this is the biggest challenge he faces and says it's the, the first time in United States history that we've had to deal with two near-peer nuclear rivals. Mm. Uh, and I think that's right, and I think sometimes people think that the basics of nuclear deterrence theory and, and nuclear strategy have already been solved. But, but I think this is a new challenge that, that nobody really has the answer for now. And I know it's uh, something we're w working he on here at the Scowcroft Center. I think Rob is doing some work on this. Um, I know our colleague Brad Roberts, a former DASD uh, out at um, Livermore, is, is working on this. So I think a lot of people are trying to get their uh, heads around this. Uh, but, but I do think it potentially does m um, uh, mean there, there could be major changes coming in, in U.S. strategic forces policy. You know, essentially the way the United States has sized its force in the past is, is to count up the strategic targets uh, in the adversary. Uh, how many targets do we need to hold at risk? That's the number of warheads uh, that we need. Um, so as the number of Chinese warheads go up, you know, if we're not going to uh, rethink uh, U.S. Uh, you know, deterrence policy, then the answer would be, well, we need more warheads uh, to hold those targets at risk. Uh, so I think this is a debate uh, we're going to have over the coming years. Do we uh, do strategy the way we've always mm -hmm. done? There's a good argument for that. It, it seems to have worked pretty well over the past 70 years. Or do we need to change uh, to a, a kind of a minimum deterrent? Or do we size for Russia and do a minimum deterrent against China or, or vice versa? Uh, and so I, I think I agree with Rob on that, that this NPR teed up the question but didn't really uh, answer it. And I suspect that will be the job for um, you know, strategists outside of government and maybe for the next NPR. So if we come back a year from today, have an event here, we'll have all the answers? <laughs> we'll, we'll have it figured out by <laughs> come back on uh, you know, Thursday. Well, Dimitri, if I could just say what makes this debate so interesting and potentially uh, volatile is the uncertainty, right? Because you have, you have the contours of the debate already. You've got the uh, sort of the arms controllers who are afraid that if if you, uh, if you believe, uh, well, they're afraid of sort of an open-ended requirement for, nu for more nuclear weapons or maybe even nuclear testing to respond to the threat, right? So they're, they're, they're afraid of too much. Others, uh, I call them the deterrence realists, they're afraid that we're not going to do enough to address the Chinese threat. And it's this band of uncertainty that's creating a lot of tension, right? But I think, in fact, uh, the answer is, is uh, there is a compromise answer that doesn't require a lot of more nuclear weapons uh, that can be, you know, wrapped up in an arms control framework. But the quicker we come up with an answer, I think the quicker we can uh, try to build a consensus over the ultimate solution, which includes mm -hmm. things other than nuclear, of course. Yeah. 
and I think the, there are many practical problems, like how you allocate weapons. Do you say you have to have a completely separate force for China and for Russia? Do you need to rethink what it is you need to hit? I mean, at various times, there's been a tendency to generate generate as many targets as we can use. If you've got a, this is just an example, if you've got 2,500 nuclear weapons, you've got to find 2,500 targets for them. That's not quite right, but sometimes we get dangerously close to that. We need a much better sense for both China and Russia of what it is we actually need to hit. Part of the problem in this field is that the answer, if you're talking about a secure second strike capability, is relatively simple. You need to be able to have, and blunt and grim, that you need to be able to have a capability, no matter what the adversary does, to essentially end them as an organized government. Awful that we should think about it, but the answer is relatively straightforward. For everything else, the answer is pretty complicated. We're now talking, for example, about what we would do if Putin uses a nuclear weapon in Ukraine. Only one or two. Uh, we've got the same problem with China. And I think those are the problems which are not broadly going to be covered by changing numbers. You know, can I ask you, you know, one of the things the review says, and this is to get back to a discussion in the earlier panel about the balance between deterrence and then you know, reducing the reliance on weapons in the future, arms control, et cetera. Um, putting aside Russia for a second, um, you know, with China, there was some discussion after President Biden and President Xi spoke, I think it was either September or November, and Jake Sullivan came out and said the Chinese had shown a willingness to talk about strategic stability. Um, but it's, you know, that roughly a year has passed, and it doesn't seem that there's been any real discussion and the Chinese may have said it or Xi Jinping may have said it, but it doesn't appear that he was serious. So how will the administration kind of um, achieve this balanced approach if the Chinese aren't even willing to come to the table, you know, for arms control talks and then even for the kind of crisis mm -hmm. uh, control mechanisms that the Pentagon is having so much difficulty doing even in, you know, other areas that don't involve nuclear weapons? Mm -hmm. Easy question. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, I think um, the Nuclear Posture Review does a very good job of laying out the importance of strategic stability, the importance of arms control, the importance of risk reduction. Um, but of, co of course, you're dependent for a lot of that on, you know, having um, an adversary that's willing to engage on these issues. Um, and so China has not um, so far been willing to engage. Um, and then, of course, the strategic stability dialogue with Russia has stopped mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so you have New START expiring in 2026. It doesn't give us a lot of time, um, and I'm very concerned that um, we might now, you know, the debate is, are we going to be facing a world without any verifiable arms control mm -hmm. in 2026? You're, we're just running out of time. Um, and so I don't think you can just uh, rely on, on talking to adversaries um, to solve the risk of risk reduction, to solve strategic stability, and what we need to be doing um, as we look at future deterrence, is increasing resilience. Um, it's making ourselves less vulnerable to attack. If we are attacked, for example, if um, our strategic assets, uh, nuclear command and control assets, are attacked in space, that we are able to fight through, that mm -hmm. we've got layers of redundancy, um, that we can absorb an attack without forcing uh, a quick decision mm -hmm. by the president or, um, or going up the escalation ladder to using nuclear weapons. And I think, um, so to answer your question, um, we need to focus on the things that the United States can be doing, which is increasing resilience, which is looking at innovation. Mm -hmm. We've got our tremendous capability and strength vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia is our um, technological innovation and creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to be applying that to nuclear deterrence. Maybe if I could just probe on that a little bit more, yourself or anyone on the panel. When the Pentagon China Power Report came out roughly a year ago, most of the attention or the top line attention was on the projection for warheads. But one of the most interesting things in the report from my perspective was the number of satellites that have been put into <coughs> space that the uh, PLA will be able to use for their weapon systems. How concerned are you that actually the US is becoming relatively much less resilient 
when it comes to the ability of Chinese satellites to complicate um, American nuclear policy. Yeah, I, that is that should be a key focus of our nuclear posture, frankly. Um, and I think there should have been more um, emphasis on resilience. It does mention resilience and innovation, and I think that's a very good first step forward. Um, but I think that needs to be fleshed out a lot more. Um, and so, given that um, you know we have uh, you know our legacy space satellites um, have become you know what General Hyten, mm -hmm. um, the former vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, has called um, fat, juicy targets. We need to move away from that model and um, build much more resilient, not only resilient systems, but resilient architectures um, that will make it harder for our adversary to attack. Uh, and I think introduce more strategic stability into the system. Mm -hmm. Some people say we shouldn't weaponize um, space. I would say it's, it's too late. Uh, space is already weaponized. The United States depends on space a lot for its uh, military operations. And, and the Russians and the Chinese understand that. And so they're developing a lot of uh, counter space uh, weapons. So it is a uh, challenge. It's part of the reason the Trump administration developed a, a, or uh, established the Space Force and mm -hmm. um, uh, Space Command. And, and so I, I agree with uh, Leonor, we, we need to figure out a way to make our space architecture more, more resilient uh, against those kind of attacks. Can I ask you, what, one of the things um, that wasn't in the report at all is looking at the role of hypersonic weapons. And you know, we wrote a year ago that China for the first time had flown a hypersonic weapon around the world, nuclear capable. How do those kind of weapon systems factor into the way the US should be thinking about nuclear policy? Is that a fundamental change, or is that just one more weapon and it's really the same issue? Yes, it's, <clears throat> I think the hypersonic threat is actually much more serious with conventional forces to give a very quick capability to go after niche targets. My, my favorite is to try to take out the, <clears throat> our ground, the ground part of our surveillance system in the first hours of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the hypersonics give some greater flexibility. Um, they're maneuverable. We can't defend against them. Of course, we can't defend against thousands of nuclear weapons on ballistic missiles either. I also think one of the things that we need to do is to think much more seriously about what it actually is that deters these countries. What it is that we can be, we can credibly threaten, credibly incentivize, and that's how you, we, we don't have to deter the Rand Corporation. We have to deter China or Russia. Um, to go back to very old history, in PD 59, in the Carter administration, we at least made a serious effort to say, what is it that the Russians, the Soviets value? And broadly, the interesting part of the answer was the survival of the, the, survival of the Communist Party, mm -hmm. uh, survival of the regime. Now, is that true of China? Is it true of Putin? What are the things that we need to do, including how we structure our diplomacy, our programs, so as to impress on the Chinese and the Russians that there is no way they can gain an advantage by using nuclear weapons. And indeed, that there's no way they can gain an advantage by a massive conventional attack. We're unfortunately seeing that in, in Ukraine. I've always believed that if there is ever again use of nuclear weapons, it will be because of a conventional flight that's gone out of control or that people on one side or the other mm -hmm. think that they need to use nuclear weapons as a way of dealing with that problem. But can I ask you, and this is going back to a question <coughs> from earlier to a certain extent, in, in order to work out what the Chinese think, um, you need to talk to them. I mean, General Hyten has an interesting story. When he was writing his master's thesis on what China would do with his nuclear arsenal, he asked the Chinese students in his class, what are you going to do? And he says that if you read what they said then, it actually matched quite well with what's happened. But there is very little, um, relatively little communication between the government here and the government in China. 
U.S.-China relations are in a really, really difficult place right now. So how can the U.S. work out what China's thinking? You've got a reluctant partner on the other side of the table, even when they come to the table. Does anyone have a, a clever way around that? I think you've identified a, a good problem, but I always thought it would be neat to write an article, how, how to think about nuclear strategy when you don't know what the other guy is thinking. Mm. Right? So, so there's some basic fundamental things that you can do, and one is assuring the survivability of your second strike capability, right? And this gets back to your hypersonics example. The big fear of hypersonics is that they'll be able to uh, you know, disarm us, take out our command and control so we can't respond. We had a similar fear during the Cold War, right? The, uh, mm -hmm. the, the cruise missiles fired off a submarine off our coast. We've always had that problem. And we, we know we've had that problem. We know we're going to have the problem with hypersonics, and we deal with it through, uh, through uh, improvements in survivability. Mm -hmm. And Admiral Richard has already said publicly that he's thinking differently about the way he, he thinks about warning, nuclear warning, warning of attack. And there are things that we can do today uh, to mitigate the threat posed by, by these hypersonics. I think our biggest vulnerability is and always has been the command and control system. Secretary Brown had an interesting answer. He said what we have to, we were always worried about a so-called decapitating strike. Mm -hmm. And what Secretary Brown said, if I were in Russia, I would wonder whether it was really a good idea to change the decision maker on whether the United States would use nuclear weapons from the President of the United States to some two-star in an airplane that the more effective the decapitation was, the greater the likelihood of an overwhelming response. Well, that's, in some ways, that's not a bad way to think about it. But we now know that we're in this middle ground where we're not talking mostly about a massive attempt at a first strike to disarm. It's much more complicated uses of nuclear mm -hmm. weapons as a way, essentially, to manipulate a conventional situation. And that's what we're seeing from the Russians today about in Ukraine. If I could jump in on that, I think that was another strong point of, of the NPR. Mm -hmm. It does talk about the risk of, of limited um, nuclear uh, use in a conventional conflict or using that threat to coerce uh, the United States. Uh, and I think that's uh, right. Uh, but just uh, uh, then transitioning to, to a criticism, then I, I think the question is, you know, if Russia uses a nuclear weapon or two in, uh, say, Ukraine or against a NATO ally, um, if the United States wants to rely more on nuclear deterrence to deter China from invading Taiwan, um, how, how would we do that? And I think the answer is with more of these uh, non-strategic um, nuclear capabilities. Uh, and so um, one, one of the questions I've been thinking about is, you know, w what are the capabilities we need for that? I'm, I'm not sure the B-61 gravity bombs that we have currently are, are the right answer. It requires getting an airplane basically directly over the target. Mm. Uh, and so I know Rob in the 2018 nuclear posture review was working on w what are the additional flexible options uh, we need and came up with this low yield submarine launch ballistic missile and this uh, nuclear slickum. And, and so I, I think it was good to have those options. And so, uh, you know, this NPR decides to cut the nuclear slickum. Um, it will be interesting Which is a to submarine see. launched cruise missile for. That, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, and then, you know, but it seems that bipartisan majorities in Congress uh, have restored funding uh, for that missile mm -hmm. in, in the defense bill. So it'll be interesting to see um, what happens there. And maybe Leonora Robb, who worked on the Hill, can let us know what, what happens when there's an executive legislative dispute mm -hmm. uh, over a system like that. But, but I, yeah, I think we, well, maybe we do want to have some of those. Just for a step back, and what, is, what was the logic for getting rid of, what was the logic for introducing? that system in the first place, and then what was the logic for deciding to abandon it? All right. So what, what kept us awake at night when we conducted the, uh, the nuclear posture review was the um, uh, Russian tactical nuclear weapons, right? 2,000, maybe, you know, 10 to 1 uh, advantage mm. over us. And the fact that they seem to be integrating this into their strategy, they've been practicing to it. And uh, we, we need to do something to, to disabuse them of the notion that they could use these weapons and get any advantage, right? And so there are a number of things that you can do. You can say that, well, if you use uh, uh, you know, a low-yield nuclear weapon, a tactical nuclear weapon, we're going to respond. And, uh, but there's a difference between saying it and, and, and demonstrating it. Uh, the wonderful line by former or ex the existing NATO Secretary General, uh, Jens Stolenberg, who said, deterrence starts with resolve. You can't just feel it. You have to show it, right? 
And so we needed, we needed a deed to show, to convince Russia that they could not get away with this, with this strategy. And, and China actually was also thinking along these lines as well and developing these capabilities. So that's why we said we had to do something. But were, were there not other things in the U.S. arsenal that could have achieved the right. same result? Right, right. So, so there are things, <laughs> as, as, as uh, 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 Dazzy Johnson pointed out, we, we have the B-61, but you pointed out a, 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 a potential vulnerability there. There's the air launch cruise missile that you can launch from a bomber, but again, that, that requires time. But in, in the Asian context, uh, you don't actually have a, a presence of nuclear weapons, right? We do have weapons, as you indicated, deployed in Europe, but not in Asia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we realized, again, politics is really important when you do these reviews. We realized that uh, actually asking our allies to host nuclear weapons would be a heavy lift. So the next best thing to have that presence there, to have that promptness and presence, would be a, a nuclear sea launch cruise missile, which would be based on a attack submarine, and our attack submarines are constantly plying the, the waters in, in that region, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the Slickham provided a, a demonstration with deed uh, that we were taking uh, Russian and Chinese mm -hmm. limited nuclear use scenarios seriously. It provides uh, presence, which, which the other capabilities do not provide, right? Uh, but here's another reason that, that we didn't articulate um, uh, directly in the nuclear posture review, and this is related to the two nuclear pair problem, right? So as Russia and China start to build up their capabilities, especially China, mm -hmm. you worry about the survivability of U.S. nuclear forces, right? The worst case scenario is if, if they can devise a way of, uh, of disarming us in a first strike. And so, again, job number one is survivability. Mm -hmm. If you deploy sea launch cruise missiles on, say, 40 or 50 attack submarines, and you wouldn't put a lot of them on there, you would just have mm -hmm. some. You have now made the attack problem impossible for Russia and China. And so you've improved the survivability of our sea-based leg as well as the wreck of their triad. So you, can I just quickly ask Leonora, so if, if it's such a good solution, why was it taken out? Well, I'll give you the opposite view. And I think the administration made the right choice um, in canceling the program. The program actually hadn't even started development in earnest, right? There had been a lot of studies, very low-level funding. Um, while the administration, um, uh, right in the Trump administration, it was again a study um, by the Navy, and the, and the Biden administration had low-level funding to keep it alive while they decide what to do. Mm -hmm. So it's canceling the program, but it's the program had n barely even started. Um, so this really wasn't a real capability yet. And what we're talking about is, do we want to develop a new capability that we would have, you know, seven years, ten years from now? Um, and I think given the nuclear modernization that we are pursuing, including um, stealthy B-21s, mm -hmm. um, the uh, long-range standoff weapon that will be also available um, in the 2030s, that we will have new modern capabilities. Uh, and I don't see um, this deterrence gap that, that the Trump administration was talking about. And, and sorry, we do have... Um, you know, we do have low yield or lower yield capabilities in our arsenal. You know, we've never said those are just for NATO or Europe, right? It's, it's a range of capabilities that we reserve um, in our nuclear mm -hmm. forces. Um, and so, you know, I don't think there was that deterrence gap. Um, we did have uh, existing capabilities. And again, adding a new program on top of an already stressed and important nuclear modernization program uh, would have been very difficult and I think endangered um, the other higher priority programs. Okay. Sorry, Walt, you wanted to add I also think we need to remember that one of the main functions of our declaratory nuclear policy is r not just deterrence of the adversary, but reassurance of our friends. I think the military case for a uh, sea launch cruise missile with a nuclear warhead is at best marginal, as other people have said. There are lots of things that are, uh, we can reach the target if we need to. I think it's much more important that for better or for worse, the Japanese in particular think that they would really like to have something they can point to and say, this is for you. And that that aspect, and, and I must say right now, mm -hmm. the idea of canceling a program which is important to our Asian allies, is not the right signal to be sending. 
I, I don't think it's as much military case for it, but <laughs> not least because it wouldn't come in. We get the benefit of saying we're going to do it long before it becomes available. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think there is a failure sometimes to recognize that nuclear weapons are at least as much about perception and politics as they are about actual hard military capability. Leonor, did that's you want a, to come back? That's a communication problem with our allies, right? That's, right. that's, a, um, that's not necessarily a military capability problem. Um, and so again, I think that comes back to, we need thick engagement with our allies. That's, that's the crux of mm -hmm. extended deterrence. Um, and, um, and they need to understand that our uh, capability to threaten and use mm -hmm. nuclear weapons in their defense um, is, is credible. Um, and will happen. And, and so I think, again, that comes to alliance management, mm -hmm. um, to, you know, having a close relationship mm -hmm. with our allies. Um, and I don't think, you know, we need to spend tens of billions of dollars um, necessarily to say, here's one mm -hmm. um, nuclear weapons capability that's, that's just really for your assurance. So I want to come back to something that was asked in the, the previous panel, and not just because some of the officials are still in the room. Um, David uh, Sanger, the moderator in the first panel, said, should the U.S. have tactical nuclear weapons in Turkey, and should the administration be thinking about ways to somehow get those weapons out of Turkey without insulting a NATO ally? The, the DCA, the dual-capable aircraft, is exactly an example of what I'm talking about in the Asian countries. Let's be honest. The reason we have the dual-capable aircraft is because the Europeans want them. You're talking about the F-35s? The yeah, F-35s, yes. Yeah. The, what, the, the systems, I think we do not officially acknowledge that there are any in Turkey. We do officially acknowledge that there are some somewhere in Europe. But let, let's, and, I mean, yes, but we know they're there. So let's speak about yeah. the reality and not kind of, in Washington, no, we I like to think, paper over things. I think the reason that we have them there is they are very important, rightly or wrongly, mm. They are very important to our friends and allies in Europe. And that's a legitimate reason to have some military capabilities. They're not useless. It's just that the principal case mm. for them is their political effect. And to some but, degree, their political effect. I think, I think David's question was more, some allies are more reliable than others. Is it OK to have these kind of weapons in Turkey? Um, well, it's interesting. We did take them out of one country on security grounds. Um, you know, I, I think that's a question of can you actually make them secure? It's all very well to say they're at Incirlik and that it's uh, the Tur Turk control Incirlik. I think if you really think there's a danger that they could be misappropriated in a coup, you need to think about mm -hmm. that. Um, the uh, the problems of the security has always been a problem. I don't know any more today about what the situation is. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to Q&A. Um, the first question is from Lauri Nurmi, who's a NATO correspondent at Italeti from Finland. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And the question is, uh, NATO's expanding <coughs> in the Arctic and northern regions as Sweden and Finland join the defensive alliance. There's now a lot of talk in these countries about NATO nuclear weapons. What's the role of the U.S. nuclear deterrent in the defense of NATO's northern member nations and its planning? Who would like to take that? Matt. Well, I would say that um, uh, yeah, the U.S. nuclear umbrella is for all uh, treaty allies, in, including the new members of NATO, uh, Finland, and or soon to be new members, uh, Finland and Sweden. And so, uh, you know, they've been partner countries for some time. And I'd, I'd talk to uh, officials from those countries, and they'd say, well, we're not allies, but really your nuclear umbrella kind of protects us too, right? And I was like, well, uh, not really. You know, Article 5 is for NATO members, and so I think that is one of the benefits of them joining the alliance is that they are now formally uh, covered by U.S. nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also been some news um, recently because the, some Swedes and, and uh, the Finnish uh, were, were asked, uh, you know, would they maybe host U.S. nuclear weapons? How do they feel about nuclear weapons? And they basically said, I think, rightly, that, hey, we're just now joining the club. We're, we're not uh, we're keeping our options open. We're not, and some people I think said, "Oh, they're they're you know w wanting to host nuclear weapons," and I think that's 
not the case. I mean, you know, let's give them some space. They're, they're new members to the club. Yeah. I think they're not making um, you know, firm commitments on, on anything at this point. Okay. Um, another interesting question from Tom Caraco at CSIS. Um, how do you believe, sorry, excuse me, how do you perceive the deliberate decision on the part of our British allies to increase the number of nuclear weapons at fields? Are they responding to an increased salience of nuclear deterrence that we are perhaps trying to avoid? I guess you should ask the British. Uh, in the, the absence of any uh, <laughs> British nationals the on Briti the stage, the Briti I'm Irish, I can't answer that one, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, right. The, uh, the British are determined to maintain an effective nuclear deterrent that is, to a very considerable degree, at an operational level, independent of the United States. It's not independent fully in terms of weapons development and to a slightly lesser extent submarine technology. And I, I mean that seriously. If the British feel that they are more confident that they have an independent deterrent with larger numbers, that's probably the reason. Mm -hmm. and, and seriously, they must have said things. That, we, there, that is a place where dialogue is useful. But just a, a short story. A, a former British Defense Secretary asked me during the Trump administration, would it be possible for President Trump to launch a nuclear weapon without anyone stopping him? And how did the process work? And I said, there are lots of theories. I don't know the exact answer. How did it work in the UK? He said, I don't know. They never briefed me on what I would have to do. <laughs> <laughs> True story. I... Um, uh, question from Sangmin Lee, uh, Radio Free Asia. Uh, the Nuclear Posture Review has called, uh, has called any nuclear attack by North Korea to the, on the US and its allies the end of the North Korean regime. In response, the North Korean Foreign Ministry has said that the U.S. is the only country that has set Pyongyang as a target, as the government of a sovereign state. What do you think about North Korea's reaction? To uh, I think one of the most interesting, at least mo one of the most uh, specific and novel parts of the new NPR is the paragraph about North Korea, which is absolutely bloodthirsty. You know, that we will destroy you as a, as a regime, a regime, not as a country, if you, if you use nuclear weapons. I think that's probably a good message to send to the North Koreans. Um, uns, under, unsurprisingly, the North Koreans say, it doesn't bother us. You know, you, and I you're th just yeah. troublemakers. I think that was a good, I think that's a good area of continuity, too, with <coughs> the Trump administration. Mm -hmm nuclear posture review, which um, for the first time made a similar statement. I think reiterating that I think was important. Interestingly yeah. enough also, the, con the, comp uh, the contrast with the next paragraph, which is about Iran, is sort of much very low key, very let's try to keep from this from being a problem. We still want to have Iran. And uh, it's no doubt partly because mm. we're trying to negotiate a follow on to the JCPOA. That language might change if Iran does have the weapon, as North Korea does, mm -hmm. presumably. And I, I think just on the North Korea piece, um, obviously we're here to talk about the nuclear posture review, but I think the missile defense review, I think is also, mm. um, was very well crafted. I, I think it was a very good, um, broad approach to missile defense, and, and I think an important element um, in, in our response to North Korea. Okay. Also an area of remarkable continuity for a democratic administration to begin the statement on nuclear, on uh, missile defense, is that the, a limited defense is essential, is pretty much of a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Just a quick comment on North Korea, if I could. I think this is another um, element of continuity and goes to U U.S. nuclear strategy for years, which is we, we don't have a one-size-fits-all deterrence policy. Mm -hmm. The way we deter Russia is different from the way we <coughs> deter North Korea, that was true in the Trump NPR and, and also true in uh, this NPR. If you'll notice, it doesn't say, you know, if Russia uses nuclear weapons, it's the last thing you'll ever do. We'll come yeah. to downtown Moscow. Um, but we do say that to Pyongyang. Yeah. Easier to say when they have a much smaller arsenal yeah. as well. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, so on missile defense, um, how does technology, and this is from sort of Johannes uh, Bonakli, how does technology meant to defend from missile attacks, such as the glide phase interceptor, fit into this conversation? How could it change the course of deterrent strategy? 
Well, you know, the, the current missile defense policy, uh, and, and this, this again reflects continuity, again, over, over three administrations. We actually have two, two missile defense policies, one to protect the homeland and one to protect regional forces and allies, right? So with respect to the homeland, again, we bifurcate this. Uh, with respect to Russia and China, we continue to rely on nuclear deterrence mm -hmm. to try to, to hedge again, you know, to deter those attacks. But with respect to North Korea and other rogues, our policy is to stay ahead, right? And so to the extent technology can help us stay ahead of that threat, that's good. But again, Dimitri, to get back to the, the two nuclear peer problem, as that becomes uh, a more of a forcing function, as we become more worried about China and Russia's you know, uh, collusion or limited attack options, there might actually be a role for limited defense against, uh, against uh, Russia and China. That is a big <laughs> policy debate to be had, but I think that, that resurfaces the debate. Um, we're just a couple of minutes away from ending. Can I ask you just to close out, ask each of you, what was the thing about the NPR in 30 seconds that surprised you the most, either in a positive or a negative way? Um, Walter. How similar, this is one of the few areas where if you changed a little bit of the rhetoric, you could have issued the Trump administration's NPR or the Trump administration could have issued the Clinton administrations and um, in the Obama administrations. Obama. Mm -hmm. there, there is a high degree of continuity. One of the main things that we have an advantage is that there is a remarkably broad agreement on some pretty basic and pretty difficult principles about nuclear deterrence that it's one of the few areas mm -hmm. where at least not yet we have a bipart we have a partisan polarization. Leonor? Yeah, I mean I, I agree. I think the amount of continuity, I mean it essentially continued with the same capabilities, right? Deploying the W seventy six dash two that was introduced in the Trump administration. Um, so, you know, strong uh, coming out strong in favor of the uh, nuclear modernization program of record. You know, it, um, very similar language on strategy of damage limitation. Um, so I think, um, and then, you know, you even, even though the uh, president had tasked um, uh, it's an, it, his administration with reducing the role of nuclear weapons, mm. um, you know, that has stayed the same. Uh, you even have certain sentences within the nuclear posture review that say actually our nuclear deterrent um, underpins all our national defense priorities, which I thought mm -hmm. was um, surprising and I think should raise some questions. Um, in, especially in the context mm. of, you know, if, if the president's goal was to reduce the role, it looks like we're actually expanding the role of mm. nuclear weapons in, if, you know, um, in certain instances. Um, but I think, it, again, it could have done a lot more with looking at um, emerging capabilities, innovation, resilience, uh, and those were key principles that were mm. laid out in the national defense strategy. Um, that I think could have been um, applied a lot more broadly um, to the nuclear posture review. Okay, uh, Rob. You know, I was I was surprised that there were no pictures in here, like there were in the Obama <laughs> and Trump. No, I'm just I'm just kidding. No, uh, in, in fact, in fact, there 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 are very little. The Atlantic Council has made up. For that, <laughs> no, but, uh. no there, there are actually very very few surprises here because if you've been tracking uh, what they've been saying, the administration and congressional testimony and the budgets, this is more or less uh, tr true to that, right? But again, the, maybe, maybe if there's a surprise, or, and I'm gratified to see, is, is, that, is that threat, the understanding of the threat, especially the two nuclear pair problem. That is a big deal. That is, that is historic, I think. Matt, the final word. Yeah, so, so just um, two points. Um, uh, you know, I, I know there were healthy debates within the administration about um, uh, some of these things, and people view, uh, view these issues differently. And sometimes you can almost see that debate and tension coming through in the document. You know, we're not going to a no uh, or to a sole purpose policy, but we hope to we might create the conditions yeah. to, to do, do that in the future. There are some other uh, examples like that where you can almost see the administration uh, debating with itself in the document. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, just tying uh, my colleagues' points together, I think that Walt and, and uh, Leonor are, are right that there's a lot of continuity. And on balance, I think that's a good thing. You know, if you look at our nuclear modernization program, mm -hmm. it's uh, going to be in place for decades. Uh, so you do need... Uh, bipartisan consensus to keep that um, in place. Uh, but then tying that to um, Rob's point, uh, the threat environment is changing. China's buildup is, is really uh, changing things. And so I think the big challenge going forward is can we 
adapt this kind of bipartisan consensus uh, in this new, more threatening security environment through the 2020s and into the 2030s. So we'll, we'll have to invite everyone back to uh, talk about that in, in the coming years. Sounds good. Well, on that note, I'd just like to thank everyone for a very interesting discussion and uh, to the Atlantic Council. Thank you. Thanks thank to the audience. You. Thank you.